welcome to the Flexibility Seminar. Uh, we have a 90 minutes uh, packed getting into a background of what flexibility is to refresh us from some basic physiology concepts and then moving into a particular reflex-based technology for improving flexibility in the muscles and fascial system known as muscle energy or PNF stretching. And that's what we're going to uh, be digging into today. Uh, hopefully you're in some comfortable loose clothing and you may have a little space to stretch out a little bit later as we go through our little webinar. If you have questions about this topic after today, you have my contact information here on this slide. Uh, Edgesize Resources is my company for continuing education and edgesize.com has my connection information for both uh, web and telephone numbers if you have any questions or inquiries uh, even after the program is over. So uh, greetings once again uh, coming to you from New York. And the challenge is how flexible are you? How flexible are the people that you're working with? How many of you can actually stand up, bend forward and touch your toes without bending your knees? or as this guy here is going backwards, that's a little extreme for some of us. We're looking to see what is normal flexibility and what are we looking to restore in the clients we're serving. So take the challenge. How would you like to be this guy? This is one of our uh, Pocono llamas out there and uh, he has excellent flexibility, but could you imagine he wouldn't have a good time if he didn't? So flexibility, ability to move through a range of motion of a joint or a chain of joints. Now we're all connected kinesthetically, so we talk about something called the kinetic chain. All the joints in the body are completely connected. You can't really isolate them and just say, oh, well, my knee is stiff, but what does it have to do with my ankle or my hip? Knees, ankles, and hips are all connected, so we have chains of joints throughout the body, and our flexibility, our mobility range, needs to extend across those various joints. So essentially, we're looking at stretchability. Let's take a look at what normal documented range of motion or flexibility is. And that's typically measured you know, medically using goniometry, that fancy little protractor with the two arms on it that tells one how many degrees a person has moved through a range of motion. There's also flexibility screening where instead of looking at individual joint degrees of range of motion, you look at overall tests you can do something as simple as measure how far someone can reach and there's sit and reach tests for doing that. So we'll just take a little peek at some of the basics of flexibility and then go into how can we manage helping people who've lost some of that flexibility that's now impairing their performance. So what is normal range of motion? Goniometry, of course, is one way to look at it. And you will see here documented ranges of motions using a goniometer from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. And these are their standardized national normative reference values for range of motion joint to joint. Uh, there's oodles of flexibility screening information online. And I highly recommend even just using Google or Google Scholar to look up some of that work. Uh, many of the sports medicine journals, biomechanics journals have information, physical therapy and athletic training journals, of course, personal training journals have information on that as well. But functional testing is really the latest way to look at flexibility. What is required for an individual's performance? Well, what are they doing? Are they a runner? Then they need to have particular flexibility, especially about the ankles, the hips, and the knees. But remember that the torso rotation, their arm swing needs to be flexible as well if they're going to use everything they've got to win that running race. What kind of performance are they using to be a secretary sitting at a desk? Don't need tremendous amount of flexibility for that. And sometimes sitting too long, of course, will begin to impair someone's performance. As you know, you don't use it, you lose it. So we need to see what is the performance of the physical activity that we're looking to have for goal for this particular client? And is there something in the way of that physical performance related to poor flexibility? So here's a little bit of our measurements for neck and up middle lower back range of motion. A cervical spine, of course, forward bending flexion, 45 degrees or chin to the chest. Backward bending extension, also 45 degrees. Rotation, looking each way. You know, driving a car, you want to see who's passing you. Uh, normal here, 60 degrees of range of motion. 
lateral flexion, bringing your ear to your shoulder, 45 degrees. And then looking at the trunk, which is the combination of basically below the neck to above the gluteal region, and that would be trunk flexion, is 80 degrees of forward bending at the lumbosacral junction, or average of fingertip to the floor. If someone is bending forward, reaching for their toes with the knees straight, you should be able to reach at least four inches from the floor. Trunk extension, more measured from the low back where most of the backward bending comes from, 25 degrees. Rotation or twisting, either way, 45 degrees. And of course, side bending or lateral flexion is 35 degrees. I'm going to show you some of the uh, muscles involved in neck flexion extension. Uh, any of these pictures, of course, that you see here are from Primal Pictures. Uh, they're very nicely animated anatomy if that interests you, and they are borrowed with permission of Primal Pictures. You can see some of the muscles stretching in the extended neck position, sternocleidomastoid coming up in the front, uh, on the side on the right, so some of the longest coli muscles, some of the scalene muscles in red on the left side, and the muscles that you see in green are doing the contraction there, and the muscles behind the neck performing the extension maneuver. How about the shoulder? One of the very most common areas that people become stiff, particularly with rotator cuff injuries, uh, overuse injuries, especially reaching overhead, and sometimes just the whole act of getting older. Sitting too much, not moving around enough, we tend to get very limited range of motion in the shoulder. So you may test along with me for any of these motions. Uh, of course, be careful if something is uncomfortable or painful. You should have that checked by your physician. But go ahead and try some of the motions along with me so you're moving and not just sitting. So shoulder flexion, reach your arm all the way up overhead. Normal degrees, of course, is 180. You should be able to bring your arm straight up in alignment with your body. Shoulder extension, with your elbow straight, reach back straight behind you. That should be about 60 degrees. Abduction, that's moving your arms like a jumping jack. Way up to the side, over your head, 180 degrees. And then medial rotation, that's if you have your elbow bent and your hand in front of you, pull your hand toward your belly. That's medial rotation or internal rotation. That's 70 degrees. That's useful for pulling things toward your body. And then lateral or external rotation would be out to 90 degrees. So if your arm is at your side, your elbow is bent, and make believe your, your forearm is like a door hinge and the door is swinging open. So you're swinging your palm out away from your stomach. That should go out 90 degrees of lateral rotation. It shows some of the uh, rotator cuff muscles and other muscles of the shoulder. Uh, up at the top of the slide in the red, you see some of the uh, deltoid muscles. Coming in here, infraspinatus, teres major, latissimus coming down in green. So we get a little review of a few of the muscles while we're here. Uh, elbow, forearm, wrist, a combination motions, elbow bending, 0 to 150 degrees, and of course extending would be 0, so we left extension out, it goes just to a straight line. Forearm, if you have your elbow bent, your arm at your side, and you turn your palm up, palm down, that's pronation supination, so supination palm up, 80 degrees, and then of course palm down, 80 degrees as well. Wrist flexion is bending the fingers toward the palm, wrist toward the palm, wrist flexion, 80 degrees, wrist extension, bending the palm away from the rest of the arm or fingers away from the rest of the arm, 70 degrees, radial and ulnar deviation. Well, the ulna is the bone on the pinky side, and if you move your palm toward the pinky side, that's going to be, of course, ulnar deviation. There should be 30 degrees of mobility. And then radial deviation, moving the hand toward the thumb side, bending from the wrist. That would be radial deviation, 0 to 20 degrees. And it shows you some of the movement of elbow flexion extension. Of course, if you're flexing the elbow, you have some of the biceps, brachialis muscles working there in green. Um, the tricep stretching the muscles on the back of the arm and coneus stretching during that elbow flexion. And then muscles of the wrist here as well. Uh, the hand is shown with the wrist in an extended position and the green muscles lighting up some of the wrist extensors. The red muscles stretching here some of the wrist flexors. For the hip range of motion, another area that tends to tighten up, particularly over time uh, or with overuse and underuse injuries. So hip flexion, if you're sitting and you just pull your knee up toward your chest, flexing your hip, that should go about 120 degrees comfortably. Uh, hip extension, 
If you stand up for a moment, stand up and reach one leg way back behind you and point your toe back behind you, that would be hip extension, which is normally 30 degrees. Of course, when you, we see our dancers, they can flip their foot over the back of their head, no problem. But uh, you'll find that many so-called normal everyday people are a little stiff in the hip flexors, causing limited hip extension. That comes into play quite a bit when we watch people walking and running as well. A hip abduction, if you're just standing in place, hold on to something to maintain your balance. Spread your leg up, lifting it to the side, that's abduction, should be 0 to 45 degrees. And adduction, if you crossed one leg in front of the other or behind the other, that's adduction 0 to 30 degrees. And of course, a rotation, if you're sitting in your chair and just want to try it, sit with your hips and knees at 90 degrees. And the medial rotation or internal rotation, lift your foot up sideways, away from your other foot. Lateral rotation, lift your foot up inwards as if you're sliding your heel up your opposite shin. That would be lateral rotation, like when you go to cross your leg to put a shoe or sock on. That should be 45 degrees of lateral rotation. If people get stiff here in the hip rotators, you can imagine they have trouble just getting their shoes and socks on. Here's a picture of some of the uh, hip abductors, adductors, and which are also rotators here. Okay, knee and ankle flexibility, range of motion. Your knee should be able to bend or flex to 130 degrees. You could try that just sitting in your chair or standing. Bring your heel back so that your calf touches the back of your thigh. Angle dorsiflexion, easy to do in sitting. Just pull your foot up, bending it forward at the ankle at 20 degrees. Plantar flexion. Point your toes away from you, so bending the ankle down away from your face, 0 to 50 degrees, it's plantar flexion. Now if you turn your feet inward, turn the sole of your foot so that the two soles are facing each other, that would be inversion or 0 to 35 degrees. And then if you turn your feet out so that the soles are facing away from your midline, ankle eversion, the small range, 0 to 15 degrees. Those motions are very helpful for getting people to walk carefully across unlevel surfaces and adapt without falling. And uh, if you combine motions, what we typically see in the fitness industry and in therapy, the straight leg raise test. When someone's laying on their back and lift this leg straight up in the air like a rocket kicking, there's a straight leg raise. That should be about 80 degrees. Most people consider that a test of hamstring length. So I show you here, uh, knee is in the flexed position, of course, stretching the quadriceps muscles in the front and the hamstrings working through the back, as well as lower leg gastroc. People often forget that the gastroc muscle in the posterior calf is also a flexor of the knee. Uh, down at the ankle, looking uh, at the plantar flexion, okay, dorsi and plantar flexion. So here the toes are pointed down, putting a stretch through tibialis anterior, some of those dorsiflexor muscles, and of course the active muscles posteriorly in green, your gastroc and soleus complex. So now when someone's coming in to you to ask for a program designed to help with their flexibility, what kind of things do you want to discuss with them? To think about, well, why are you here? What seems to be the problem? What gives you trouble? And what kind of performance issues are they having? So you want to ask them about you know, their personal needs, uh, what are their goals. I'm working with a gentleman right now who is uh, preparing for the Army and he wants to work in special forces, so he needs to do a certain very high level and demanding physical training, and he has very specific goals for these tests that he must pass, or he's not getting into those special forces. So you need to know exactly what physical performance are you looking to achieve, what race you're looking to win, what load are you looking to lift. So as specific as possible will really guide you to design a good program. So decide what is it that they need and be specific. Maybe you're seeing somebody who had a work injury and they're coming in for some injury rehab. Do they feel stiff? Is something painful to move? Movement should be comfortable. Sometimes it just feels stiff, doesn't move easily, doesn't hurt, not so much a problem. That's pretty easy to handle by just teaching an exercise program. But if there's pain to move as well, you need of course to have some you know, medical intervention to check with a physician to make sure about what they don't have, or perhaps that stiffness is so bad that the stiffness alone is causing them pain. 
And that's where our exercise programs and our muscle energy comes in, can be very, very helpful to reduce some of the pain that people feel associated with stretching. And what motions in particular feel tight or sore? Is there something they can't do? Well, gee, you know, I'm seeing an, another gentleman who's actually in the Army and he had an, a running injury and he's had some iliotibial band tension where the band of tissue on the side of his thigh that connects the hip to the knee through the tensor fascia lata was very, very tight, giving him knee pain. So we needed to do some stretching for the tensor fascia lata, the glutes. What couldn't he do? He said, well, you know, I can run really fast for a short distance on my toes, but I can't run any distance above a half mile with a normal running gait. So once he starts picking up his distance and running midfoot the way he should be running for distance, he's getting the pain. So we're trying to find out what specifically is giving you the trouble. When do you feel it? The more precision, the better. Ask him to list the intensity of the pain. Oh, you know, when you stretch that in that direction, how much does it hurt? They use the pain scale from zero to 10. Imagine zero is no pain at all. 10 is the worst pain you could imagine. Oh, you know, when I move my leg across like that, that hurts at a 7 out of 10. So at least you have some objective, some objective measurement to put in with what do they feel when they're being limited by this abnormal tension. You can always remeasure to see did the program I designed work to help reduce the pain. Use the pain scale before and after. So you always need to assess first, measure uh, know what the normative reference values are. I've given you some other resources here. A great book on measuring joint mobility or motion by Norkin and White. And there's plenty of functional tools and literature. Uh, some of my favorites, the Journal of Biomechanics, particularly for ergonomic work and sports, medicine and science in sports and exercise, uh, Journal of Strength and Conditioning, athletic training journals. Of course, the physical therapy journals are also great resources for looking at these. So decide your goals, you know, educate your client. Are there certain limitations or things they need to be careful about so that they could prevent injury? Maybe they need to take it easy from certain work activities or limit certain sports activities until they are able to regain their mobility so that they don't keep straining and causing other problems. Of course, you know, medical issues need to be managed medically, have them get cleared and checked with their physician uh, and decide what performance is actually desirable and reasonable to obtain. So you want to make sure you have reasonable objective goals. Do you have a timeline? Well, once you've worked with people a little bit, you have an idea that, hey, you know, they may need to do some daily stretches before you start to see enough change in their flexibility. That's measurable. That's significant. So I'll typically have people doing some daily stretches if they're mildly limited once or twice a day. For somebody with, say, a frozen shoulder where it's just plain stuck, they can't reach their arm overhead, I'm giving them programs of stretching three to five times a day, depending on the severity of the problem. You know, sometimes more is merrier. You want to get them better faster? Sometimes they need a little more stretching. So determine your timeline. Is it a mild problem? You may see changes within a week or two that are objective and measurable. More severe problem? Hey, I might want to see a few degrees, maybe 10, 15 degrees each time they come in, see if it's made a change. So document it, keep, keep a record. We like to show progress. People love to see when they're making improvements. So when you design a program, there's different types of stretching that we do. You know, standard stretching uses positioning and we impose an outside force. Either we're pushing on our client to help them get to the range of motion or we give them a stretch band, a stretch rope. Yeah, use that stretch rope to help you move. Sometimes they're just moving against gravity. And I like to make sure I tell people that no pain, no gain philosophy is not my way of doing things. You might feel some stretching discomfort, but if there's a sharp pain, if that's reproducing that pain that stops you from doing things, you're going too far. Too much is not a good thing, but they should feel that sense of stretching that may be a little bit uncomfortable. I usually use that pain scale as a reference. You know, if that stretch hurts you more than a 5 out of 10 on the pain scale we talked about, you might want to back off a little bit. So stretching considerations. Keep that intensity tolerable. Teach people how to use the pain scale. Zero to ten. Very, very easy to use. And when you first begin giving them some stretches to do, 
don't go right away for the complex multi-joint stretches. Give them some very simple single joint stretches. Oh, their hamstrings are tight. Okay, you can't touch their toes. It's limiting their running stride. Okay, maybe there's some things you need to look at there with the hamstring. Well, gee, is it tighter at their knee because the hamstring crosses the knee? Or is it tighter at their hip? Hamstring crosses the hip too. What does the muscle at the ankle have to do with it? Ah, gas draw crosses the knee. That could also be a problem. So I might just give them some knee extension stretches first, working across the knee, and then gradually add the hip, gradually add the ankle. And you'll see that when we get to some uh, photographic illustrations later in this presentation. So keep it simple first. Now precautions, of course. Uh, what do you do before you stretch? What happens when people stretch cold? Not too comfortable, right? A greater chance of injury. Now, very interesting that I've seen uh, mixed evidence on warm-up or exercise prior to stretching. I've read studies that say, yes, a warm-up is absolutely necessary to help with the stretching. Others say, oh, you can just stretch cold and use that as a warm-up for exercise. So the jury's still out in the literature. But I think if you consider it down to practical clinical applications, warm-ups in most situations help to get the blood flowing and it makes it easier to move. It also helps to unlink some of what we call those collagen crosslinks, little connection fibers within the fascial tissue, the tissue that holds everything together, that covers every muscle, every tendon, every ligament. So having a warm-up, whether it's a moving warm-up of some very gentle exercises, some people like to warm up with a hot shower, a hot bath, some people warm up with a massage, it's all good. So I, I'm a big fan of the warm-up first. If someone has an area that's been strained or injured, uh, you have to think about, okay, there may be an anti-inflammatory necessity after the activity, after the exercise or the stretching, because you may have an inflammatory response as the body's rebuilding from its injury. Plus, they might be more sore. So when people are in rehab, you start stretching, you work in that area that they pulled, that they injured or overused, now we like to get an ice pack at the end. Get the ice pack on 10 or 15 minutes to that area. Let everything cool down. Again, I think there's a great preponderance of literature supporting the use of cooling uh, post-activity. Uh, of course, more than 10, 15 minutes, not really necessary, but a nice little cool pack. And then progress gradually. Let them start to come back into their normal activities gradually. Don't force anything. If you force it, you might break it. And then, of course, it's yours, right? You break it, you got it. No, but that's, that's a problem. I've seen, even in the physical therapy field, uh, many practitioners forcing motions. Oh, it won't move, we'll just make it move. Hey, try something else. If the way you're trying to stretch, maybe the position you're in, maybe your hand placement, maybe the position the client's chosen to be in, is just not the best for them. So I'll simply try different hand positions, try to reposition their body in a way that's more relaxing for them. Of course, breathing is key. Having them work with some very gentle, deep breathing, diaphragm breathing, helps to relax the nervous system so it allows the muscles to stretch more efficiently. So that's something to keep in mind. Don't force it. Work with the breathing so that they can relax through the stretch. So of course, stop on the red signal. All right, more precautions. Uh, if you've had that medical clearance, if they have an injury, of course, review their records and see uh, any reasons why you'd want to avoid stretching. You know, maybe somebody had a tendon repair. And at certain points, depending on the tendon and the type of repair, it might be deleterious to start stretching. You might actually tear that repair site. So you want to make sure, you know, is there anything that you need to avoid? So check with their physician. Is there an unhealed fracture? Was this person in an accident? Is there bruising in that area? In some situations, particularly for muscles of the thigh and the muscles around the upper arm, around the humerus and the femur, those muscles, the quads, the hamstrings, the biceps, brachialis, if you stretch them too forcibly after they've had some bruising from an injury, you could actually cause minute calcium deposits called heterotopic ossification to form in the muscles. That's like having little shards of glass growing in your muscle. Excruciatingly painful. That can happen as a result of someone stretching too hard, 
too much force too far in those specific areas of the body. So not uncommon there. If you see that person's got some nice bruising, you know, the black and blue around their hamstrings, it's not time to go forcibly stretching those hamstrings. Time to move gently through a range of motion. So we always like to go over just a couple of basic precautions. Obviously, open wounds, areas of sutures or surgical staples, you know, you, unless you're trained on how to work with those, you want to be staying away or refer to someone who is trained to work with those areas, okay? Uh, sometimes people move too much. Hey, I work with people who are runners. I work with dancers. I've worked with Broadway dancers. These people are very hypermobile. Those dancers have lots of mobility. They have that body type, the genetics, that allowed them to move through those ranges of motion. So that hypermobility is normal for them. But in a person who didn't have the type of flexibility before, that would be deleterious. So you need to see, were you always this flexible? Or is this something new for you? Some people become st strained or sprained where the ligaments become elongated. That's called a sprain. And they don't just bounce back to where they were. So the joints tend to become more lax. We would say they're hypermobile or too flexible. In a severe instance, we could say that they're unstable. So if someone's already moving beyond the so-called normal ranges of motion that we talked about, you want to be extra careful to see, was their body built that way? Were they always like that? Or is this a hypermobility, say, post-pregnancy? During pregnancy, uh, it's well known that there are certain hormones that come out to help a female become more relaxed in her ligaments, preparing for delivery. But that hypermobility could make the joint sore, we need to make sure their muscles are very strong and maintain that strength to hold her together until those hormones, those relaxing hormones that make her extra mobile are dying down in the system after the delivery. So just be aware, if something's moving too much already, you probably don't want to stretch beyond the normal range of motion unless that's their normal. So you need to find out what's going on with that. Okay, different kinds of stretching techniques. You probably have a few of your own favorites of how you like to stretch. Well, on a basic level, there's static stretching, where we typically hold the joint or hold that body part still, and some people hold it for two seconds, some people hold it for two minutes. I actually downloaded a thousand articles from the internet looking at how long do people typically hold stretches. And what does the evidence say really works? Well, gee, I got a headache because they, all the evidence said different things. <laughs> which is incredible, but the preponderance of well-constructed research showed that anywhere between like 15 and 30 seconds was pretty optimal time to hold what we call a static stretch. We have dynamic stretches involving adding motion or muscle contraction. So they're not just sitting there holding a position, but we're doing what we're doing today. We're gonna to use the energy of a muscle contraction to see if using that muscle contraction alters the flexibility or alters the stretchability. So today is about dynamic stretching. Ballistic stretching can also be used, but this is something that is used only in more highly performing persons. We add like a bouncing or a jumping, okay, type of motion. Uh, it tends to be a very high velocity, a fast stretch. And those ballistic or fast stretches have a, a tendency to tear the muscle if the muscle's not ready or if you're too forceful. So there's something you know to be thinking about with the ballistic stretch. Is this an athlete that performs a great deal of jumping activities? Fine, if they are prepared for that and trained for that, which is a gradual process, then ballistic stretching may be appropriate. But the everyday Joe that comes in, he pulled his rotator cuff at work, he lifted too much in the wrong direction, he should have asked for help, we're probably not doing any ballistic stretching with him. It doesn't mimic what he's doing in his everyday functional performance. Okay, so you have to really think about what's this person's background. Those static and dynamic stretches are probably the way to go. So static stretch, uh, 15 to 30 seconds, the literature has shown them to be very effective. Matter of fact, some of the best studies from uh, Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy show that stretching for 30 seconds works as well to improve hamstring flexibility than stretching for 60 seconds. So why wait? I'm a New Yorker, I'm in a hurry. We got places to go, people to see, <laughs> things to do. 
So why wait longer if you saw that you had a good enough response? You had a nice increase of range of motion. So, and that's what much of the literature says. So you can do this on your own. Give someone a home program of stretching activities to do. They can do it on their own or especially if someone has an injury or if they're really stiff, having another person assist is tremendously helpful. So those ballistic stretches, again, we're bouncing or jerking. If someone is doing high level activities, of course, we want them to be prepared for this. Uh, thinking about some Air Force gentlemen that I'm working with, two Air Force gentlemen right now, and one of them is part of the elite search and rescue. So he needs to jump out of a helicopter. You can imagine the bouncing or jerking that his body has to sustain when he's hitting the ground. So he needs to do some ballistic stretch to prepare for absorbing that impact. So that's a very specific type of thing. We're not covering that today, but just give you a little example. Okay, we don't want to be straining the muscles in our everyday people, but our high performance people, you need to know, hey, they need to perform these maneuvers for what they're doing at work or for recreation. The body needs to be ready with a gradual practice leading up from very gentle ballistic stretching to a more high level of course, over time. Okay, dynamic stretch, that's what today's about. Uh, people have all different names for this. It'll drive you nuts with all the names. Neuromuscular re-education. We actually have in rehabilitation medicine, there are billing codes that we use for insurance company. And today's type of stretching, we would use the billing code for neuromuscular re-education. So if you're one of those PT or OT people, physiatry people, that code for that on billing is 97112, just a little FYI there. A neuromuscular facilitation, where you're going to be using reflexes to activate or inhibit muscles. In the physical therapy field, years ago they came up with the name PNF, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. It's a mouthful, but it's basically the same as muscle energy. The terms muscle energy came from the osteopathic field, well, they said, let's use the energy of a muscle reflex to inhibit or to activate, to wake up muscles to get our intended response. I'd love if they just called it reflex therapy or reflex technique because that's essentially what we're doing here. We're doing what's called facilitated stretch, tricking those reflexes into doing what we want them to do. Now, some people are stiff and they're uncomfortable. You go to stretch them or they go to stretch themselves and the body's fighting. You know, sometimes you go to stretch a client, you feel them fighting you a bit. It's like, well, how do you turn off the fight? You do it using facilitated stretching or muscle energy. We're going to use reflexes to trick the muscle into minimizing its guarding, its fight, and also trick the muscle to minimize tension so that they don't have so much pain. You can see that clients achieve greater length with the stretching. What are the reflexes that we're dealing with? This, this gets a little heavier in the neurophysiology realm, so I'll try to keep it simple for you. So neuromuscular reflexes, the basics, muscle spindle reflexes. You know when you go to get a medical exam, the doctor says, oh, I'm going to check your reflexes, and they take out that little hammer and tap you in the knee, and your foot jumps up. Well, of course, that's our muscle spindle reflex, what we call our monosynaptic reflex. The muscle actually is getting a quick little stretch by the tapping of the hammer, stretching that tendon. And of course, that message goes into the spinal cord and says, hey, protect yourself from being torn. You're being stretched really fast. The muscle contracts. It's muscle spindle reflex. There's proprioceptive reflexes, such as Golgi tendon organs. We'll talk about the little organs that live in the tendons. There's developmental reflexes. Anybody out there have children? Anybody have little babies? Anyone ever played with a baby? All right, when you go to grab the little baby's hand, maybe they're four to six weeks old and you're just playing and you see, oh, grab my finger, and then you can't take your finger away. The baby automatically grabs whatever is put in the palm. Well, that's a primitive reflex or a developmental reflex. That's one example. If you've ever watched a young baby, you know, a couple months old, turn his head to one side, he actually extends his arm sideways on that same side. That's a developmental reflex. And there's a whole host of these reflexes that help us learn how to get up and walk and crawl and do all kinds of great things. Those reflexes still exist in your body as an adult, but they're hidden. They're carefully hidden by the higher centers of your brain. Some reflexes are positional. 
So you actually have uh, sensory organs in your ears and in your joints telling you where you're moving in space. You ever get in a car and try to read a magazine and you start to get dizzy or nauseous? Well, that has to do with those positional reflexes, vestibular reflexes located in your inner ear. Some people easily get car sick or motion sick. And that has to do with the reflexes in their ears, telling them where their body's moving in space. So there's a whole bunch of reflexes that we can use to trick the body into doing what we want it to do. And that's the essence of muscle energy. We're going to use basic uh, muscle spindle reflexes for our muscle energy stretching. Let's take a look at those muscle spindle reflexes. Uh, you might have heard of the muscle spindle. It's a little sensory receptor that detects changes in length of the muscle fiber. It also checks how fast is the muscle length changing. So it's the change of length. And this is what we call a monosynaptic reflex arc. So muscle spindle senses a stretch. It says, hey, I'm being stretched. I feel the length changing. I'm going to send a message to the alpha motor neuron in the spinal cord. The alpha motor neuron says, hey, muscle contract. Protect yourself from being torn. So that's the typical monosynaptic reflex. And it has two components. And take a look at those. It has actually extrafusal fibers and intrafusal fibers within the muscle spindle. The extrafusal fibers say, hey, we're contracting. Protect yourself from being torn, from being stretched. The intrafusal fibers connect through the gamma motor neuron, and that's when a muscle senses a stretch. This is checking not just how far is it being lengthened, but how fast, the speed of the lengthening. As you can imagine, if you try to stretch a muscle too far too quickly, you're going to set off that interfusal component. And that's going to be exquisitely sensitive to tell the muscle, contract, tighten up, shorten up, protect yourself from being torn. Well, there's a built-in sensitivity. There's a built-in threshold for excitation of these fibers of the muscle spindle. And we call that spindle bias. The preset sensitivity to changes in muscle length. Some people have a very high spindle bias and some people have very low spindle bias. Some people are very reactive even if you just start stretching them a little. We would say they have an abnormally high or sensitive spindle bias. That's where you have trouble stretching and that's where people have a tendency to get injuries. So we want to see can we alter the spindle bias using the reflex of muscle energy using the reflex of muscle contraction. So we'll take a look at that as we go through. So the spindle bias, that's the threshold for stimulating the contraction of the muscle. Okay, We can actually alter the spindle bias with positioning. If any of you have taken the positional release course, you learned a little bit about that in that course. We can actually position a muscle, shorten it up quite a bit to reduce the abnormal sensitivity of the muscle to stretch and reduce some of those painful areas within the muscle as well. To give you a little review, a little pop quiz on that one. Golgi tendon organs. Well, we thought about muscle spindles before. Muscle spindles live in the bellies of the muscles. The Golgi tendon organs live in the ends of the muscle, the origin and insertion or the attachments of the muscle. So say muscle contracts too hard, too fast. That pulls in its attachment, stretching the Golgi tendon organ. GTO gets a stretch, it says, hey, I'm sending a message into the 1Bs of the spinal cord and I'm turning off the alpha motor neuron. Turning off protects the muscle from contracting so hard that it would tear or revulse its tendons from the bone. So if these GTOs keep firing and inhibiting the muscle, the muscle has to have some activity to keep its strength. If the GTOs fire excessively, you're going to find that muscle's weak. You can also use the GTO reflex to help stretch a muscle. If you want to inhibit the contraction, if someone's fighting you during the stretch, put some pressure or stretch on the Golgi tendon organ by pressing on the tendon. It's a little neat trick to help them stretch a little bit more effectively. So say I'm trying to stretch a hamstring and those tendons attach down behind the back of the knee, either side. Don't push on the middle of the back of the knee because you have back there, of course, your popliteal artery, tibial nerve comes through. But if you push on the actual tendons, if you feel little tendons, they feel very stringy behind your knee. There's a couple in the back on the inside and the outside, your hamstrings. If you put pressure on the tendon while you're stretching, you'll activate that GTO and you'll make the stretching easier to do by relaxing the muscle. 
Okay, here's something that we'll be using quite a bit with muscle energy. Reciprocal inhibition in the nervous system. Of course, you have reflexes that protect the muscles from being torn and that also activate the muscles for activity. So we're going to see there are reflexes that allow for contraction of single action muscle groups or paired opposing muscle groups. Think flexors and extensors. Flexors, say you're bringing your hand up to your face, that's flexing your elbow and of course stretching the extensors on the back of the elbow. If you bring your hand up to your face, you're activating biceps brachialis, the muscles in the front of your forearm that bend your elbow, the Popeye muscles. And of course, as you're doing that, you're stretching the triceps in the back of the arm. So those are paired agonist-antagonist muscles. They do opposite activities. Agonist or synergist muscles work together. So if you're bending your elbow to bring your hand to your face, we call that elbow flexion. The agonist, the prime mover, would be like biceps, brachialis. Synergists, okay, what other muscles are bending there? Brachioradialis might also be helping, not performing the main motion, but acting as a helper. That's a synergist. The triceps in this case is the antagonist or the opposing muscle, on the opposite side of the humerus, which performs the opposite motion. So now we just make sure we know agonist, antagonist. The agonist is a muscle performing the motion. The antagonist is its opposing or opposite muscle. By reciprocal inhibition, this reflex is set up so that the body knows when to turn on and turn off muscles, when to recruit muscles to do an activity. So if your flexors are firing, I want to bring my hand to my face because I want to eat a sandwich. I'm flexing. So the reflexes will reciprocally inhibit the extensors, the muscles in the back of my elbow, making sure I don't extend or straighten out my elbow when I'm trying to bend it. So that reciprocal inhibition allows for coordination and precision of movement. Another reflex that we'll use with muscle energy is called post-isometric relaxation. Some people call it PIR or post-isometric inhibition. Now, you'd notice this more if you were tired or you did a lot of activity of a certain muscle and that muscle was too tired. You just try to contract it again. You're like, oh, I'm really too tired to contract that muscle again. I have had enough. Well, that's something that happens even after an isometric contraction. After muscle contracts, there's what we call a latency period. We used to call it the refractory period in exercise physiology. It's used up all the biochemicals that help to contract, and it takes a little bit of time, a latency period. It's a time duration in which the muscle will rebuild all those nice chemicals that helped it to contract. So it's a perfect time for relaxation. Waste products have to be removed. Carbon dioxide that built up, CO2, is transported out. Oxygen, O2, brought in by breathing, right? Neurotransmitters cross the membranes. The actin and myosin filaments within the muscle have to uncouple or unlink. This is the perfect time to stretch the muscle. After a muscle is finished contracting, particularly isometrically, we have a window of opportunity within which we can stretch it that it can contract hard against us. And that's called that post-isometric inhibition or latency period or post-isometric relaxation. Perfect time to get in there and stretch. That's quite a bit of what we use with muscle energy techniques or PNF techniques. Same thing. We're using the reflexes to trick the body into letting us do what we want it to do. Their hamstring wants to be tight and bend the knee. No, we want it to straighten out. We want it to let go so they can stretch out and straighten out their knee. We want to use that reflex to trick the body into allowing a more effective stretch or a less painful stretch, less fight from the muscle. Well, we see in this picture, just a quick example of a muscle energy technique. Uh, if I'm looking to stretch some hamstrings and I want it to work mostly across the hip joint. You see, I'm bending his knee up toward his chest and say if that's as far as he went, I allowed his knee to be flexed and his hip is flexed. I'm stretching the hamstrings where they cross the back of the hip. So hamstrings come from the sit bones, ischial tuberosities, bones most of you are sitting on at your computer right now. They attach down behind the knee, okay, the posterior tibia and fibula, just below and behind the knee. So here I'm stretching the upper hamstring, what we call the proximal hamstring, behind the hip, I'm flexing the hip to stretch the knee extensors, hip extensors. 
Let's look at the principles of how we would use a reflex to do just that. Now, give you a little background on where these reflex principles came from, because they've been around for quite a while. Uh, neuromuscular facilitation or inhibition concepts were first described by Dr. Sherrington and Cabot. Uh, Dr. Fred Mitchell is an osteopath at Michigan State University called using reflexes muscle energy technique. Uh, this is all the way back in the 50s. Uh, physical therapists, not in Voss, were writing at the same time as Mitchell describes his muscle energy. They were describing something they called PNF, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. Others came along, called it new techniques, post-systematic relaxation, PIR, active isolated stretching, AIS, active release technique, chiropractors like to call it that. They had a little soft tissue work to the reflex stretching techniques, and the list goes on and on. I like to refer primarily to what's out in the literature that shows that it works, and that's going to be under the terms the PNF and muscle energy or MET technique. The others are the newer versions. Um, I've seen them represented in the literature, but mainly just as case reports. Oh, we tried this with a client, and this was the result we had, as opposed to let's try this in a randomized clinical trial with a large volume of clients, and let's apply a standard statistical package to treat the data in a methodological way and see how that works. So that's what we really want to look more at the clinical trials. So, so many names. Muscle energy technique is the osteopathic, PNF from PT, active release, ART from chiropractic, uh, active isolated stretching. I see quite a bit of that in the athletic training journals. So, lots of names for the same thing. It's basically reflex technique to allow the muscles to relax so that we can stretch them with less pain, less aggravation on the part of the patient, less work for us which makes it very nice. We want to see if we can use these reflexes to ultimately improve someone's physical performance. I'd like to take the definition of muscle energy uh, from a Dr. Phil Greenman. He wrote a book called Principles of Manual Medicine. It's very famous in the osteopathic field. And he defines muscle energy or muscle energy technique, MET, as a, quote, manual medicine treatment using voluntary contraction. So there's the hint. If the person can't understand you, they're not likely to be able to give you a voluntary contraction now, are they? How about someone who just doesn't have the ability? Maybe they have some spasticity. Maybe they had a head injury and they're unable to control that muscle at will. So they don't have the ability to do a voluntary contraction. Well, then obviously this te technique is not for them. This is for people who can actually follow some directions and give you at least a twitch contraction. Even a tiny contraction is all you need to get some of these reflexes to work. Now, I'll mention on the force of the contraction required. I have seen it listed in literature anywhere from imagine the muscle contracting to you must use exactly five pounds of force or this doesn't work and everything in between. Uh, clinical experience doing this for 30 years as a physical therapist, little force is all you need. You don't need a strong force. But we're going to talk about what's in the literature in terms of how do you time this, how much force do you use. But let's take a look a little bit more into Dr. Greenman's definition. So, okay, so it's a hands-on. Manual medicine means a hands-on treatment. They're going to be following our directions to give us a contraction. And, quote, contracts the muscle and precisely controlled direction at varying levels of intensity. And I love his terminology because precision is key. So many people go into their exercise and training programs and I've watched them. They are downright sloppy. <laughs> Sometimes it's a nightmare to see some of these people working out and wondering why aren't they getting the results that they desire. Precision is key. Controlling the motion is key. And what about the intensity? Well, how do you know how much force to use? How do you know how long to hold? So varying levels of intensity is very important. Now, way back when, when I started at my first job, I was at the VA, Veterans Administration Medical Center, downtown Manhattan. And I remember when I went to PT school, my teacher said, oh, you have to have the patient pushing you as hard as he can, and you have to really resist and push back. And the first day of work, I got a new name, the bone crusher. There she is, <laughs> the bone crusher. You, you hurt me yesterday. So there's something that you need to think about. You don't need to be forceful. 
I learned that right away. I uh, use varying levels of intensity, and we're going to see that reflected here in a couple of the slides upcoming. How much force do you use? And of course, where are we applying this force? Okay, we're using a distinctly executed counterforce. And again, distinctly executed, wonderful terminology on the part of Dr. Greenman. Where do you place your hands when you're helping a client to stretch? Where do you place your hands? Do you place them over the joint? Do you place them above the joint, below the joint? When you're helping them to stretch, do you barge right in suddenly? Or do you gradually start to increase the pressure of the stretch? Do you ramp up the force to increase the pressure gradually? So it's all about how you execute this. Moving too suddenly, moving too abruptly, you can tear muscles. I've known of therapists getting sued because of being too forceful, too sudden, too abrupt, not thinking about, not feeling the response of the client on the table. And that's something you want to pay acute attention to. So precision, specificity, what direction are you stretching? Do you know, do you know what muscles are responsible for limiting the flexibility of that joint? Do you remember those muscles, origins, and insertions? Do you remember the muscles, actions? Do you remember the joint angle at which it's best to stretch that muscle? So direction is important. Duration. Much of the literature says 15 to 30 seconds is pretty adequate time to get a good increase of range of motion for holding your stretch. Intensity. Well, gee, is this my high-level athlete who's in the peak of fitness and performing well? Or is this someone who's had a work injury, who got out of shape and just wasn't ready? Or maybe it was someone who had both issues. They had a work injury, they're in great shape, but now they're not able to perform. So they're starting to atrophy, they're starting to tighten up and lose some of that wonderful strength and flexibility that they gained with their training. So you have to look to see. The intensity will be different based on that person's condition. How about the quality or type of stretching? So you want to be very precise with each of these. We're going to take a look. Okay, and that nice little uh, falls up there. Upstate New York, some stretching concepts, types of stretching. Okay, you have range of motion. Stretching basically could be passive. So the client is just kicking back and relaxing during the passive stretch. Active assistive. The client is helping with the stretch and you as the practitioner are helping along as well. Or the client might be using some kind of outside tool such as a strap or a belt to help them stretch, or of course, is stretching machines as well that may be active assistive. And of course, active, the person is actively engaging and performing their own stretch without any outside force. All of these can be used as home programs as well. So how about passive stretching? People love this. Oh, I'll just lay here and you can stretch me. I'll just kick back and enjoy it. That's it's pretty good stuff. I, I'd love to get a good stretch like this once in a while. So the practitioner is doing the work. Nice part about the passive stretch, when we hold this over a period of time, you get some fascial release. If you attended our myofascial course that we had you know, several weeks ago, we talked a little bit about releasing the connective tissue that surrounds and invests all the muscles right down to the cellular level, the fascia. So the passive stretch is very nice for that as well. Typically, we hold this for a period of time with a passive stretch. Uh, again, could be from seconds to minutes. Most of the literature says 15 to 30 seconds is effective. Uh, in certain cases, holding that minute and a half to two minutes might be more effective, depending upon do they have scar tissue or is it just simple stiffness? It makes a difference. Active assistive stretching. Okay, here's where we're helping them move through a range of motion. Very important if they've had an injury, very important if they don't know what direction to help and you wanna guide them. Uh, but make sure with this active assistant, the client or the patient is controlling how far you go. So you're not just forcing through their available range of motion, they're able to control it. And uh, this, this works well for people who are fighters or guarders. You know, some people just like to be in control. They're used to holding their body a certain way. Or maybe years ago, they got hurt by someone forcing them to move a certain way. And they're just inherently protective where they guard their motions. So unless they're controlling it, they're not going to let you move them. You've come across these people, haven't you? So that's where using the active assistive stretch and the muscle energy stretch 
is especially helpful. They have some control of the motion and helps them to get through that range. So make sure they see the direction that you're expecting them to move and also show them how much force to use if you're going to teach them for a home program. So I go through the hands-on techniques with clients first one-on-one -on -one, and then when I'm ready to give them their home program you know, I make sure I watch them do it in front of me. I watch to see how much force they use, what timing they wait, you know, how are they lined up mechanically in their body, how is their biomechanics, are they actually stretching the area that we're looking to stretch. You know, people tend to cheat, don't they? They tend to compensate. I'm looking for them to stretch their gastroc, their foot's towing out to the side, their knees bending, they're cheating left and right. So you need to watch before you give them a home program. Make sure they know how to do it right. And then of course, for the more independently oriented, active stretches, your clients can do it on their own. They're in control of the whole situation. Um, this you may find, if someone is very limited in motion, if they're very stiff, or if their body has been compensating for a long time for that stiffness, it's gonna to be tough for them to do this completely actively. So having some outside tools, things to lean on, could be very helpful. So what are indications? When do you use stretching? So here we're using reflexes to assist the stretching if people have you know, substantial stiffness, if they have pain when they're moving, and especially those people who just fight your stretches, we call that guarding, the kind of resisting the motion. These using the reflexes tricks them into relaxing more and letting go. So of course, indications, they have limited range of motion, poor flexibility, they can't reach as far as they should. And it's really common if they've come out of a cast or a brace from an injury. Or even most people don't think of <clears throat> immobilization. The person doesn't have to be in a brace or a cast to be immobilized. They might have just stopped moving that body part on their own because it hurt. How many times have you seen somebody, oh, my back went out, oh, I pulled my neck, and they still don't move very well because they were so used to stiffening up to protect themselves from the pain. Once the pain was gone, they had that happen. They didn't stop doing it. So that immobilization doesn't necessarily mean they were in a cast. Be aware that people might have guarded because of pain, which could even be long gone. And then, of course, if they've had traumas, injuries, accidents, that fibrosis or scar tissue could have set in, and that's where you want to get some, not just regular stretching, but some myofascial release stretching as well. So some contraindications, again, meaning it could be deleterious to do the stretches if they have unhealed fractures, open wounds, you know, recent surgeries. Again, if, the, if you are a medical practitioner and you're used to working with these things and you know how to work around the contraindications, of course, that's fine. But if not, make sure medical clearance is obtained. You, know, you don't want to spread infections or rashes. I had a client come in covered in poison ivy. I said, I can't treat you today. He's itching from head to toe. He was high as a kite on Benadryl, scratching, oozing. I said, no, I think you have a rash. We're not stretching you today. He was so funny. He said, come back in a week when you're feeling better. So undone, unknown diagnoses. What about the person who says, you know, everything's been stiffening up and it's getting worse and worse. And you know, who knows? Maybe they have a certain disease runs in their family. Maybe they have suffered an infection of some kind. If you don't know what their problem is coming from, they need to get that medical clearance. I already mentioned the instability or hypermobility. Gee, we don't want to stretch people beyond a normal range of motion unless that was their, say, pre-injury normal. That's different. So contraction types, just keeping us on the same page here. <clears throat> Isometric contraction. So uh, I'm assuming you're probably sitting in your seat here looking at the slide. So if you're sitting in your seat and this is comfortable for you, bend your right elbow, put your left hand on top of your right forearm and bend your elbow, but don't let it move. So you're trying to bend and flex your elbow, holding tight, that's isometric. Your biceps, your brachialis, those muscles are keeping their same length. They're isometric in their contraction. Okay, concentric. Now, if you're bending your right elbow and resisting with your left hand, but allowing your hand to come up to your face, so allowing the movement to happen, that's a concentric, or what we call a positive contraction. Concentric, the muscle's shortening as it's contracting, which is what it does for living, and it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. It's shortening as it goes. So the joint is going through a range of motion, 
from the muscle contraction. Eccentric contraction or isolytic contraction, uh, kind of a new term for that, the muscle is lengthening when it's trying to shorten. Just a reminder, you may recall, muscles can only do one thing for a living, right? They can only shorten. They can let go, but that's not really doing anything. That's letting go. So if a muscle is lengthening, it's because of an outside force that's stronger than it is. So bend that elbow, bend that right elbow, put some pressure on that forearm with your left hand so that you're trying to bend the right elbow, but you're making that arm straight now, making it straight now. So you're losing, you're not able to bend because the outside force is greater. That's your eccentric or isolytic contraction. Anybody know which builds up strength the fastest? Okay, iso close. Isometric is actually probably the safest to work first in most situations, but the eccentric or the lengthening contraction is actually the one that will build strength the fastest. But it's also the one that makes the muscle most what tomorrow? Sore. So something to think about. If you, it may build you up the quickest, but it's going to make you more sore. So typically, we don't use that from the get-go. We use that after someone's been on program for a bit or used to these activities. We usually start with isometric, move to concentric, and finally eccentric. Okay, so isometrics. Muscle length is unchanged. It's very easy to perform if you just try that on yourself. Uh, typically, these are the strengthening contractions that are the easiest to do, less likely to injure. Concentric is a shortening, what we call positive contraction, very easy to do, and that's our typical strengthening. Oh, let me give you some bicep curls. Pick up these weights, bend your elbow, bend your elbow, concentric. Eccentric, the muscle's being elongated. It's trying to shorten, but it's losing. Uh, you gave them too big a barbell for those elbow curls, those bicep curls, and they can't curl. Actually, their elbow is straightening out because the weight is just dropping on them. And that's called a negative contraction or eccentric. Too much of those could be deleterious to the muscle, could cause a strain or pain. So interesting uh, guy named Dr. Leon Chaitow. He's done some voluminous work publishing all kinds of information about muscles, contractions, flexibility. And in his description of muscle energy technique, he says, well, what do you do to use muscle energy? First, you have to identify well, what muscle is tight. We would say the tight muscle is a short muscle. Well, muscle can't you stretch very well. So we're going to actually get in and resist that short muscle at the barrier. Hmm, what's the barrier? It's the end limit to the range of motion. Oh, I'm trying to reach my arm forward. If you're thinking about the elbow here, I'm trying to reach my arm forward, but I can't quite straighten out my elbow. Ever since I was in a cast, my elbow stayed a little bent there. So we'd say, okay, what muscles are short? Anybody know what muscles are short at the elbow if you can't straighten it out? So if I can't straighten out my elbow, I'm thinking, okay, the biceps that crosses the elbow, the brachialis, uh, brachioradialis, these are the short muscles. So what are we going to do for muscle energy? You're going to ask the client to give you 20% or less effort in bending that elbow. 20% or less what we call maximum voluntary contraction. That's effort or intensity. So we'll actually resist them. I'll say, you know, I'm going to have you push against me, bend your elbow, and resist them at the end of their arm there, the distal radius and ulna. Give me 20% or less effort. Just bend that elbow a little bit. Hold it, hold it, hold it. To have them hold that isometric contraction. Hold it still for two or three seconds. Then as they relax, okay, relax and let go. As soon as we feel them letting go, they're not pushing anymore. And it's key to wait to make sure they actually let go. Follow with a gradual stretch of that short muscle. So you're gradually straightening out the elbow passively for them. So they feel a stretch going through those elbow flexors, that biceps, that brachialis, that brachioradialis. And then at that point, once they let go, you're holding that stretch for that 15 to 30 seconds. One of the reasons this works, and this is all reflected in the literature from EMG or electromyographic studies, is a 15 to 30 second latency period within which the muscle has to recover from its previous isometric contraction, even if it was only a couple seconds long. And that latency period allows the area to be stretched more easily, and it tends to be less painful to the patient. So I typically will repeat this technique for three to five repetitions. Resist the short muscle at the barrier. So at the barrier means I'm going to stretch out their elbow as much as it goes within their tolerance. I'm just going to repeat that again. 
within the tolerance of the client, that they feel the stretch, but within the tolerance means it's not painful. Even if they're not telling you it hurts, if they're tightening up, can't you tell? If they're fighting you, you could look at their face, you could feel their arm fighting you, that means it's too much. So I back off, so I, I stay within their tolerance, Okay, contract the short muscle, bend your elbow, give me contraction of that biceps, good. Less than 20% of your effort, not 100%, less than 20%. Hold it, hold it, hold it, two, three seconds, relax. Okay, now I'm gonna stretch you out and hold them about that 15 to 30 seconds and we'll do five repetitions like that. You should be able to see a measurable increase in the flexibility using this muscle energy technique. So it's a simple post-isometric relaxation. You could also use other reflexes, uh, contracting the antagonist, in this case, the elbow extensor, to reciprocally inhibit the short flexor. What do we do? Okay, I want them to straighten out their elbow. First, I did from the last slide, bend your elbow, hold it, hold it, hold it, relax. Let me stretch you, they stretch. Now, help me to stretch you, help to straighten out your arm. So have them activate the triceps of the elbow extensor. That's using reciprocal inhibition, inhibit the flexors, get the extensors to work. The other trick I mentioned earlier, press on the tendon of the muscle that's short. So press on those elbow flexor tendons at the elbow. And as you put pressure on the tendon, the GTO reflex inhibits the flexors, lets you go through more movement. How about just asking the client, visualize, I want you to picture your arm straightening out as straight as it could possibly be. What about using the other side of the body? There's reflexes across the body, so they could contract the contralateral or the opposite side of the body muscle to facilitate that same one. So if I'm looking to straighten out their elbow on their right arm, I'll say, yeah, it really work to straighten out your elbow on your left arm at the same time. So using that extra effort gets another reflex to cross the body and help you. So there's all different ways of helping. What if you want to strengthen with muscle energy? Well, to increase strength, you can activate the antagonist or the long muscle to go beyond the barrier into the weak range of motion. So what is that antagonist? That's the triceps. Now straighten out your elbow. Picture it being very straight. You can also use automatic reflexes. Automatic reflexes are like the ones when you get hit with a reflex hammer. If they, you hit the triceps with a reflex hammer, you apply a quick stretch, that makes it contract right away. So you want to wake up the triceps to straighten out the arm, do a quick stretch. Tapping on the triceps can be helpful. Vibration can be helpful. If you want to activate the right triceps, or right arm extension, you could tell them look to the right with great effort. While you do your TheraBand exercise, while you do your resistive exercise, look in the direction that you're trying to straighten out that right elbow, so look, turn to the right, that uses developmental reflexes. This is beyond what we're covering here, but just give you an example. Writing reflexes. If you want to wake up their elbow muscles, they can't straighten their elbow all the way, have them stand up, plant their palms right on the kitchen table, and do some little table press-ups or table push-ups. That's some of the writing reflexes, helping them to weight bear on that extremity. So getting them out to the gym after that, once they've woken up, very, very helpful. So precautions, don't overdo it. Don't let them cheat and use the wrong muscle. Be very precise about the direction you want them to go. And key, if you're using that post isometric relaxation, make sure that they are relaxed before you start pulling on them, because otherwise you could tear the muscle. So I'm gonna show you just a couple techniques and things, and if you want to try some of these on yourself or someone, if you have someone there to practice with, we're gonna be focusing on the range of motion or stretching. Say for the shoulder. A person had uh, been lifting too much or maybe they played too hard in their baseball game throwing they had a rotator cuff irritation and they can't reach their arm up overhead. Here I'm showing them to increase shoulder flexion. So to make it easy, set a goal. What's the goal? I want to increase shoulder flexion. I want your arm to go all the way up overhead. Okay, well there's lots of motion to the shoulder but if we're looking just primarily at the glenohumeral joint, arm coming up overhead, of course the, the clavicle, collarbone moves, the scapula moves, shoulder blade moves. There's a combination of motions. I would stabilize the scapula, have them reach their arm overhead. And if you're thinking about, well, how do we use this post-isometric relaxation? You have to think about, okay, what muscles are short and tight? If I can't reach, reach the arm overhead, the shoulder extensors. Latissimus dorsi, you see pictured here, teres major, long head of the triceps, posterior deltoid. 
Those are the muscles they should feel the stretch. So you'll see several slides of these guidelines for range of motion. State the limitation. Shoulder can only flex 120 degrees. What did we say was normal? 180. What are the short muscles? We just named them. What are you going to contract? The short muscles. Okay, we resist extension. Pull your arm down toward your feet. Hold it two or three seconds, lightly, less than 20% of your effort. Relax, and I'm going to bring you more into a stretch. Oh, I'm going to hold that stretch for 15 to 30 seconds. How does that feel? Make sure they feel the stretch in the muscles that you're aiming at. Because if you don't have it in the right alignment, they're going to be feeling something else. Some people will start arching their back because their lats is really short. You know, remember, connects to your back. You just saw it in the picture. So I might say, okay, I want you to keep your back flat on the table. Just asking them to bend their hips and knees might flatten their back. So that's an example, three to five reps. How about abduction? So in the picture you see him abducting someone, say he got stuck right there. Maybe he moved to 120 degrees and he can't go all the way up to 180. I'm stabilizing the scapula by holding my left hand on the top of his right shoulder blade here and just bringing him up from his humerus. So what are we stretching? You can't abduct. Can't bring your arm up sideways like a jumping jack motion. What's short and tight? Pecs, lats, long head of the tricep, Terry's major. Again, some of the same muscles. Shoulder adductors. Go through the same guidelines. State the limitation. What motion is limited? How much? What muscles are short and tight? What are you going to contract? The short and tight ones. Lightly, less than 20% of effort. Relax and stretch them. So it's going to get boring after a while because you see the same thing happening over and over. Who hasn't done a straight leg raise? You want to lift that leg up. What muscles are short and tight? Are you thinking, oh, hamstrings might be tight. Gastric might be tight. Let's try to bring that leg up. What are we going to stretch? Knee flexors. So these are your hamstrings, semitendinosus, semimembranosus, biceps. They come from the ischial tuberosity down to the fibula and tibia and gastroc, okay, the nice bulgy muscle from the back of your calf, attaching from the posterior femoral condyles all the way down below your ankle to the tip of your heel. So you're going to be stretching the whole back of the leg here. Knee flexors and hip extensors. If you're flexing the hip, you're going to be stretching the hip extensors. Glute maximus and, of course, hamstrings. Go back to the guidelines. They're straight leg raise. You want them, say, up to 80 to 90 degrees. What's the limitation? Oh, they only get to 60. What's short and tight? The hams, the glutes, the gastroc, soleus. Okay, what muscle are you going to contract? Those. <laughs> Push your leg down to the floor when I try to lift it up. Push it down. Give me less than 20% of your effort. Okay, relax. Oh, stop arching your back. Stop lifting your butt off the table. Oh, your knee is starting to bend. There's things that you need to do to correct them so that they get the good stretch. I might even dorsiflex their ankle. Pull your toes up toward your face so we stretch them across there. Now take care with the straight leg raise. Sometimes you know, people have disc problems, uh, spinal vertebral disc problems in the low back, and they shouldn't be getting numbness or pain you know, other than a stretching sensation down their legs. So if that's an issue, of course, have them checked with a physician. Okay, who's not tight in those hip flexors, right? Check out this. This girl happens to be a fitness educator and bodybuilder. Tight hip flexors. So we're using a sideline position. Now to keep her back from arching, because her back just arches right up. Her pelvis just tips forward when I try to extend or bring her right leg back. So I have flexed her left hip and knee, as you see in the picture, to keep her back more flat. Otherwise she got back pain trying to extend her leg there. This is another position to get hip extension. It's called the Thomas test. See, I have the hip and knee flexed on one side, left side, but here I'm stretching the right side in this gentleman, hanging the leg off the table. Of course, this assumes I have a very sturdy table to work on. So what are we stretching? Hip flexors. Iliacus muscle from the internal iliac fossa, psoas muscle, comes off lumbar spine. Very important. It comes off the intervertebral discs as well. No strong contraction is allowed here. If you put the psoas in a big stretch and you have them contract too hard, too fast, you can actually tear someone's discs, herniated disc. I had two patients previously who were suing their previous two different physical therapists for doing that to them. So very, very cautious. Note we told them less than 20% effort. I tell them also when stretching the hip flexors, I want no back pain 
when I'm stretching the front of your hip. I want you to feel the front of the hip and thigh stretching. I want no back pain whatsoever. And then some of the hip muscles come down the rectus femoris. You see coming down the leg here from the front of the hip bone, AIIS, right down into the patella. Doesn't show you the whole connection here, but there's rectus coming across, sartorius, a lot of hip flexors. Another position. So I've already showed you three positions for stretching the hip flexors. It would take, of course, hours of a seminar to show you all the different positions, but just to give you an example, many ways to approach the problem. Here, if I'm putting someone on their belly prone, if they had some back pain, I might put some pillows underneath them to keep their back from arching, keep them more comfortable. So just some different options. And again, we're back to those guidelines. State the limitations. Name the short muscles. You guys got to know your muscles. <laughs> review. I need to review too. Now, even after teaching kinesiology in college for 10 years, I still review because we forget. And it makes you very precise. It makes you quick. So you can come up with these remedies right away for people. So little nice uh, downtown of our Coast Guard. We do some volunteer work with the Coast Guard downtown Manhattan. Just thought you'd like to see a little shot of the city. Remember, too, multiple joints can be involved. So if you're doing some stretch of the hamstrings, trying to increase a straight leg raise, trying to get his legs straight up in front of him, remember that gastrocnemius muscle crosses the ankle joint. So I'm going to add some dorsiflexion of the ankle at the same time. I don't squash his patella by pushing my hand against his kneecap. That's not good. I see too many trainers doing that on people. I'm holding my hand above the patella, above the kneecap, so that I don't put too much compressive force over it. So just little things like that. There's a little close-up of that gastroc in red there coming down from the knee to the ankle crossing two joints. Review that anatomy. It makes you sharp. It makes you quick. So same guidelines, this time for ankle dorsiflexion. So same thing. How about at the wrist? What about somebody with a golfer's elbow? What if they have medial epicondylitis? Too much typing, too much gripping, lifting. You want to increase wrist extension. What are you going to stretch? The wrist flexors. Wrist flexors are shown here in green in the action of flexing the wrist. So you have some of the uh, flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus. Okay. Flexor corpi radialis, flexor corpi ulnaris. Guidelines range of motion. They can extend their wrist back to that 70 or 80 degrees you're looking for. Maybe they're limited to 35. What muscles are short? Wrist flexors, finger flexors. What are you going to contract? Those. Bend your wrist and fingers. Hold it. One, two, three. Give me less than 20% of your effort. Relax. As you relax, I'm going to start bending your wrist backward to stretch those tendons. Stretch it 15 to 30 seconds. See how they do. Three to five reps. Same thing with the neck. You could do some nice stretches. Some could, someone could be sitting, they could be laying down for this. But what's tight? Who's not tight in their upper traps, right? Up in those upper shoulder muscles. So from the neck to the shoulder. Trapezius, scapula elevator, tips the head to one side. So here I'm planting down the acromion of the scapula, holding the scapula, asking to shrug up the scapula. How do you do it? Contract the scapula. Shrug your shoulder up a little bit, hold it two, three seconds, relax, and then pushing the acromion, pushing the scapula down, lengthening the muscles on that side of the neck. So very easy to do. I've given you some of the pictures. You have some of your sternocleidomastoid here, some of the other muscles coming down, uh, splenius muscles, some of your posterior aspects of the scalenes. So same guidelines. You can make a little chart for this for any joint for the guidelines for range of motion. Okay, so you want them to be able to get climbing, get going again, get hiking, get where they want to go. So you know mu muscle energy improves range of motion. There's plenty of literature out there. Uh, I've given you some references at the end here to look at. If you're looking for more references, uh, feel free, of course, to email me. Uh, or just Google muscle energy or PNF under Google Scholar, and you can see all kinds of fabulous research. It's very, very well documented we see a nice increase in flexibility when using these techniques. Remember, being gentle is key. Be specific. Identify what's stiff. What is it you want to do? What's your goal? Stretch gently into the new range. And then teach the client how to do that on their own. Using straps or using leaning against a wall or leaning against the floor. Whatever they can do. Remember, if they're sore from the stretching, might be sore the next day. If they haven't stretched in a while. Teach them how to use that ice pack 10 or 15 minutes on there to calm things down. Or some people 
if they've had an injury, might have had some anti-inflammatories prescribed by their physician, you know, whatever they need to do. Massage is always great as well. And you want to get them back to doing the things they love, right? So there I am kayaking out here on Long Island. And join me one day. So a little uh, case studies, if you have some time, uh, identify on someone what's stiff, what's tight. Try using some of this muscle energy technique, PNF technique. Actively have them contract those short, stiff muscles. As it relaxes, you'll find you can move into a greater range of motion. Be sure to follow the stretching with some activity that they would typically do. If they're a tennis player, have them try some tennis swings afterwards. They don't have to be on the court, but I'll have people bring something in. I had a lady I was treating here who fell and broke her shoulder. Uh, she happens to be an emergency room uh, practitioner. And I said, look, your shoulders, you know, stiffness is finally going down. And what is it you'd like to do? And obviously you have to move patients to the emergency room. She likes to bike ride. She had trouble turning the handlebars of the bike because the shoulder was stiff and unresponsive. So what else do you like to do? I like to golf. I want to go golfing. Bring your club. So her last visit, she brought her club, and after doing the stretches and the muscle energy, she started showing me some of her swing. I said, I want you to practice your swing, but first, you need to get those stretches. And I showed her how to do her own little contract, relax, muscle energy. So come up with a functional activity that they could do, especially something that they will enjoy. They're enjoying it. They're going to go ahead and do it, and include as a home program. So I've given you a few different references on some of these very recent uh, aspects of literature showing how well these muscle energy and PNF techniques work. There's also Dr. Chaitow's book on muscle energy is here for you. I highly recommend to uh, check it out. So you have a few different references there for you. Uh, different literature is out. So I wanted to also thank um, the pictures you saw of anatomy aboard with permission from Primal Pictures. Uh, that's a little reference for those folks. And I'd like to give also a special thanks to Dr. Verber Moore and Susan Nida again, especially for helping with the technology aspect of getting this seminar out there to you. And I'd like to especially show my gratitude to all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and enjoy this little chat on flexibility. And do feel free if you have further comments or questions to contact me at edgesize.com. 